Superheroes. Everyone wants to be one, right? Now, what if I tell you that everyone in this room actually is a superhero, a security superhero? And what do, do superheroes need? Superpower. And they always need more power, right? So let's talk about power, the power of privacy. If you use your security superpowers to defend privacy, privacy itself becomes a superpower and even a force multiplier for your security battles. And that's why I'm here today to tell you I want to tackle some common misconceptions about privacy and explain how, when you, you combine security and privacy together, you will get a lot of advantage. Because security and privacy should team up. This is me, Professor Privacy, a real-life superhero. I know, I can see some of you think, like, where's the cape? Where's the flashy costume? Well, rule number one, no capes. And you don't need a flashy or a tacky costume to save the world, right? I mean, honestly, the superheroes that do wear those things, they're just in it because they like the attention. So what's my mission? I am here to protect the individuals and their rights, and I do so by minimizing data, thereby data abuse. I analyze and I fix systems. So let's talk privacy. Privacy is important. Privacy matters to me as an individual, and I'm sure it matters to you too. Think of the offline world. You don't want a random stranger to come peeping into your bedroom or your living room, right? For the online world, it's the same thing. There's all these personal data being collected about us. We share all those things. We don't want all of those to be just publicly available to anyone, right? So it's we rely as individuals on those companies and their security and privacy superheroes to tackle this. Boo! Boo, don't listen to her. <laughs> God. You got something to say? Yeah, you heard me, boo. Nobody needs this privacy crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was expecting you. <laughs> um, actually, when I was talking about tacky costumes, I uh, assumed you would already magically appear because, oh my god, what is this? Thank you. <laughs> so, um, this guy is um, Captain Security. Captain Security! Da -da -da -da. I would do the introductions, but I'm sure he would do that himself because he loves to talk about himself. Because that's what heroes do. I'm Captain Security. I spend my nights protecting systems. I spend my weekends limiting user privileges. Sometimes I take holidays off. And I find weaknesses and exploit them through the power of cringy dad jokes. <laughs> I'm also a card-carrying member of OWASP. Is everybody familiar with o of OWASP? The Honest Worldwide Association of Super People? Yeah, you should go check it out, os.org. Definitely worth the trying. But you, you, what are you so focused on users about? We need to protect the system from the users. No, individuals, users are the most important, important part of the system. <sighs> okay, Miss Privacy. Um, it's Professor Privacy. I didn't spend all those years in Superhero University to be called Miss. Anyway, we don't need this stuff. I protect the systems. Our systems are fully protected with security. And personally, I don't even need this privacy stuff. I got nothing to hide. Hmm. You're making some bold statements there, and they're wrong. There's quite some misconceptions in there, and that's why I'm here. I will tackle them. So let's elaborate on that. You're saying you have nothing to hide. Nothing at all. Are you sure? I'm Captain Security, a superhero. We hide nothing. Are you sure? Yes. So, if I would share your um, secret identity here with everybody? Uh, oh, wait, hey, hey, you have an identity, I have an identity. We all have identities, they need to stay secret. That's how we protect our families. Um, share your power weaknesses with your rivals? Uh, then they'd just beat me. Yeah. And you know, it's not just about secrets, it's not about secret identities. Privacy is about protecting personal information, like your medical history your financial situation, your browser history. Go away. And it's not just about all the things that we share ourselves. 
We have all these really cool technologies, smart devices that are collecting information about us. And we often use them in a private setting, like our homes. And well, sometimes things go wrong. A, a couple of months ago, there was this story by MIT um, that showed that um, Roomba, so the, the robot vacuum cleaner, um, they, had, they did some beta tests and lots of people got that new device in their house. And the Roomba was taking lots of pictures of everything in the house and all those pictures were being annotated. Like, this is a kitchen cabinet, this is a kitchen shelf, these are lamps, this is all the stuff you own. There were also pictures of kids, there were also pictures of people on a toilet. And how do we know that? Well, because those employees that were doing the annotation decided it would be fun to share all those personal, private pictures on social media. And a bit more recent, there was a similar story about Tesla. Supervillain! <coughs> <laughs> some of the Tesla workers were actually sharing some pictures, even some more intimate scenes, pictures taken by car cameras and sharing them among um, the workers. So obviously, these are things we do not want. Fine, makes sense at a personal level, does not apply to us. We don't contain any user secrets in our systems. Aha, uh -huh. another misconception. As I was just saying, it's not just about secrets, it's not about secret identities. Privacy is about protecting personal information. We don't have any. So, email addresses, usernames. Obviously that. Date of birth, home address. Maybe. And you know, it's not only about those obvious identifiers, Personal data entails all information that potentially can be related to an individual. So if, for instance, you were using a weather forecast app today to check the weather here in Heidelberg today. I need to know the winds when I fly. Well, that app <laughs> is also collecting personal information because they now know that you are in Heidelberg today. Oh, wait. Yeah. And it's not just about having that personal information, it's also what can be done with that personal information. If you take shopping, just one single purchase, you're like, whatever, what can be inferred used by that? But if you take a long history of shopping uh, purchases, a lot can be inferred there. A couple of years ago, there was this story um, from a local Target, so a US department store, uh, and some guy came there, you know, the loud American type of guy, I think you can imagine. Hero. Um, well, um, so he went to the manager, he's like, I'm outraged, how dare you? My teenage daughter got targeted advertisements uh, for baby clothing, for cribs, for baby formula. What are you people trying to do? Trying to talk her into getting pregnant? Well, he needed to have a talk with his daughter because she actually was pregnant. Um, and how did the target, how did the department store know? Well, it's not just because she bought a pregnancy test. No, it's based on that shopping history because when, for instance, you change your shopping habits, you start buying other vitamins, you start using unscented soaps, well, apparently you can deduce, you can infer, you can predict pregnancy. And obviously, lots of other things can also be deduced just based on shopping history, right? Well, I understand all that. It makes sense, but still does not apply to us. Our systems are fully secure. I protect them myself. Another misconception. <laughs> yeah. So, security, we all know, it's CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability. And, well... People think like privacy is a synonym for confidentiality, but clearly it is not. Privacy has its own set of um, protection goals, and that's unlinkability, transparency, and intervenability, or for the people who prefer the more US-based terminology, that's disassociability, predictability, and manageability. Now, unlinkability, I already talked about that a bit when I talked about the pregnancy inference, but you know what, especially for you, Let's throw in a superhero example, too. So imagine your favorite superhero, and you manage to track them into the same house a couple of nights by being able to tie those different um, pieces of information together, 
you're pretty certain that that superhero is actually living there. Now, throw in the actual um, identity of the people living there, and you may have revealed the secret identity of your favorite superhero. So a lot of information can be deduced from <coughs> tying together, linking together personal information. Then there's um, unlinkability and inter oh, no, sorry, transparency and intervenability, or as I like to say, control. And to explain that, I want to talk about dark patterns. Dark patterns. Sounds like my arch enemy that I fought at the top of the Eiffel Tower once. So, you all know these types of pop-ups and banners, right? What do you do when this pop pops up on a website? I know what I do. I just click on the big green button and get on with it, right? And that's exactly why and how dark patterns are designed. They are created that way to nudge us to select the less privacy-friendly option. They do so by also hiding the additional information. Maybe you're selling your soul, maybe you're just sharing your email address, whatever. This is designed to hide that information, so there's a lack of transparency in this dark pattern. Also, there's a lack of control, because <coughs> opting out is kind of hidden, and in addition, maybe you don't want to just go yes or no, but maybe you want some um, fine-tuning of those options. So there's also a lack of control. So, privacy is not a synonym for security. Privacy has its own set of um, protection goals, which is unlinkability, intervenability, and transparency. So basically, what is important here to, to remember, to realize, is that privacy has a different mindset than security. You can say, it's kind of a clash of perspectives. I would crush you. I am far too powerful. <laughs> Whatever. Um, what I was going to say is that a clash of perspectives, that's fine. It's just important to realize that you have these different perspectives and you need those different mindsets. So security, you're selfish a bit. You care about yourself. You care about the system. You care about your assets. And that's great, because that means that you focus on the underlying technology, you focus on um, securing the system as a whole, and that really helps privacy. <coughs> privacy is about caring about others, caring about the data that's being collected, about what data are being collected and why. And the cool thing there is that if you care about others, if you care about your customers, you actually also take care of your company. So it's a win-win situation there. As a hero, I really like what you're saying. I love that approach, but it would never work. Companies would never invest in, secure, in privacy. It costs too damn much. Aha, uh -huh. another misconception. So there's, a, there's surveys that show that companies that invest in privacy actually get, on average, about two times the return on investment. And a lot of companies actually uh, talked about three to five times the return on investment. Um, also, another study showed that when, invest, uh, sorry, when having a positive uh, privacy experience, brand preference shares um, increased to, uh, with, with 43%. And why is that? Well, if you invest in privacy, you actually gain trust, loyalty from your customers, from your users. And that's cool because investors also really like that. And it's more than just having these benefits. Also think about what happens if things go wrong, if there would be a breach. If you have invested in privacy, then you can kind of consider that as insurance. Because if there is an incident, you don't just have to face the consequences of that breach. You also need to prove that you have did the right thing, that you have invested in privacy, that you have implemented those appropriate technical measures that are required by GDPR, for instance. And if you didn't, well, in addition to all the, the, the impact of the data breach, you also face uh, potentially quite large regulatory fines. <coughs> and talking about security breaches, if you have invested in privacy, if you have minimized personal data, you actually also reduce the impact of such a breach, because obviously, the less personal data you have, the less you can lose. But none of this matters. Nothing will help. It just won't work 
all this privacy stuff you're talking about breaks functionality. It breaks our business model of selling user data. It breaks security requirements, too. We need to see what people are doing to save them from, each, from themselves. Aha, uh -huh. another misconception. <laughs> I disagree, but you know, before I explain, give me an example. Let's see. Sure. For example, our super secret super superhero club that you are familiar with, I assume. We don't let just anybody in. We need to know who you are before we let you in. We don't just let anybody wearing a mask in. Anybody can do that. No, you don't have to remove your mask to have um, authentication. You don't have to identify somebody. There's always better, more privacy-aware, hmm. more privacy-friendly solutions like a um, secret passphrase, a token, a badge. Oh, like how the Legion of Superheroes uses an unforgeable Legion ring. Sure. OK, I hear you. But it's not just about identity. We need to be able to communicate. For example, the good citizens of Metro City need to be able to contact their hero when they need help. Commissioner Gordon has a direct line to the Batcave. But that's not required. There is no need to have that identification of who Batman is, where he lives. Again, as I said before, there's always better, more privacy-aware solutions. For instance, did you hear about something called the bad signal? And, well, basically, security and privacy can and should coexist. Another example, if you go voting, I can see from a security perspective you like to have non-repudiation, strong evidence that people voted. From a privacy perspective, Plausible deniability might be interesting to know, to, I mean, to hide how you voted. And you know what? They can coexist. They work together for that same action, for that same vote. So that nuance is possible to have security and privacy together if you start thinking about them early. So actually, in privacy, we have this thing called privacy by design. It's a, a term that's been around since the mid-90s. And, well, it means that you implement privacy early on in the development lifecycle. It's equally useful for security. It's equally useful for when you build a house. You don't wait until the house is completely built to ask the plumber and the electrician to drop by, right? You want them in early on. You want to have the pipes, the wires really embedded in the foundation. So the same applies to privacy and to security. We actually have this really cool thing that's called threat modeling, and threat modeling that is an approach to, that lets you think about all the things that can go wrong early, so you can fix those things before they actually happen. But yeah, well, I can see you're not familiar with those things, because to you, security is just about breaking stuff, sprinkling some magic crypto fairy dust, and exploiting vulnerabilities. Aha! Now it is you with the misconception which is on the other foot. But to be fair, this is something that does happen. I know a lot of VCs like investing in those types of companies. Some teams, unfortunately, still run that way. But really, security professionals for a long time like talking about security by design, where we take security engineering, this real design principles, and we apply them based on our deep understanding of how the system actually works, aligned with business context, and we combine this with security testing, validation, finding all those bad issues, and when you combine these two approaches, it's a heck of a lot more effective. The results are so much more valuable, it saves you a ton of time and resources, and actually makes the system more secure. Now, if you're wondering how to go about combining these approaches, have no fear, threat modeling is here. Da -da -da -da. I just said that. But listen, threat modeling is this fantastic security technique that helps you find the issues early on before it becomes a problem. I literally just said that. Listen, a bunch of smart, really smart security people got together last year, and I joined them. They let me in, a bunch of eggheads in the room, and wrote what we call the Threat Modeling Manifesto. I know. And we wrote the definition of what threat modeling is. This took us three weeks. That's what happens when you get a bunch of eggheads in the room together. And we defined it like this. Analyzing representations of a system, not testing a running app, not reviewing the code, representations, some kind of model or a diagram of the system to understand at a higher level how it actually works. Representations of a system, 
to highlight concerns, not a massive Excel sheet with 3,000 vulnerabilities and security bugs, concerns, issues that we want to take care of, things that we want to pay attention to, about security and privacy, and privacy characteristics. Anyway, you should go check out the Threat Modeling Manifesto. It's at threatmodelingmanifesto.org. It's spelled like it sounds, .org. Take as long as you need to read that. I think you should look it up because, you know, my name is on there too. Wait, you're on that? Yeah. You do threat modeling too? Yeah. We should totally team up. I know. Why didn't you say so earlier? Anyway, threat modeling, when done well, is all about answering these four questions. I know. There's they are actually in the manifesto. You know, the one I co-authored? See, the logo is on there. It's a very pretty logo, too. Yes, yes. But it's all about asking, answer, answering the first question, which is, what are we working on? What is this component? How does that interface work? How does it connect to that remote service? And understanding all those deep details about the flow and all those things. And if you understand the system, if you know what's going on, you can start thinking about what can go wrong. You can start analyzing the different bits and pieces of the system and think about the security and privacy problems. And to do so, there's a number of really great and useful um, threat modeling approaches threat modeling frameworks for security and privacy that will help you uh, reason, elicit, structure your, uh, your process. And based on that, we can prioritize according to the risk when we understand the deep context, understand compensating controls, understanding the actual impact of who can cause this. We can understand what we want to build and how we define countermeasures against those threats. And then we're done. Well. That's the fourth question. Are we done? Did we do a good enough job? Did those countermeasures maybe still leave some residual risk? Did we cover the entire system? Maybe we need to dive deeper into some subparts. And when we're talking about what are we working on, this goes back to that representation, diagrams or models. Personally, I like to have a data flow diagram, looks like this, a DFD, very simple, very straightforward, lets you focus on where the data comes from, where does it go, how is it stored, who processes it. And it gives you a good visual reference to understand how the system really works. So, um, you know, George Box said all models are wrong, some are useful, but he never said it needed to, be to look this ugly. But, you know, I, I'm not surprised. Oi, my daughter's made this. But actually, counterintuitively, a perfect, final, complete diagram that looks very polished is actually less productive than something raw like this. Something like this leaves room for questions. It leaves room for challenges on the diagram. It leaves room for people to say, it doesn't actually work like that. We need to change it. When you have a complete and polished diagram, there's no room to change how you understand it. And this is the point of threat modeling. This is the point of drawing a diagram to understand and enrich our shared understanding of how the system actually works. It's also really important to apply this throughout the system to every flow, every user story, every component and interface, so you understand and get a good picture of how all the different parts work together. Once we have a good understanding of how the system works, we go through the diagram and we apply a framework called STRIDE. STRIDE is a mnemonic that helps you remember and focus on the six categories of typical security attacks. STRIDE stands for Spoofing Time, Repudiation, Personal Disclosure, Denial of Service, Elevation, Privileges. Flashing got nothing on me. Spoofing is all about identity. Who am I? Who are you? Who are they? All about changing who the system thinks we are. It might be as simple as guessing your password to a system or changing my cookie. Or like that time the chameleon stole Spider-Man's mask. Or the time that Trapster pretended to be Spider-Man climbed a wall. Or the time that Dr. Oct Octopus stole Spider-Man's body. Poor Spidey. You have something against him. <sighs> Poor Peter Parker. Tampering is about integrity. Changing data to make something break. It might be something like changing product uh, prices in the database. It might be uh, uh, fiddling with a packet over the network. It might be installing a rootkit like the penguin did to the Batmobile over 30 years ago, driving around the town all crazy-like. I have something more recent, too. Remember that time that Professor Xavier, just a couple months ago, implanted false memories in your brain? No. Of course not. Repudiation 
is all about attacks on provability. Think about any time you need to prove that something actually happened a certain way in the system, right? Like if the bank calls you up and says, you just transferred $10,000 to a 30-party account. And I say, no, I didn't. And they say, yes, you did. And I say, nuh uh. And they say, yeah, huh. And I say, nuh uh. At some point, somebody's got to prove something, right? This might be something uh, a lot more complex. This might be a lot more complex anytime you claim something didn't happen, like if you claim you didn't receive that package from Amazon. Right? Or the time that Mysterio pretended to be a good guy and faked a video to make, Spider make it look like Spider-Man murdered him. All about faking a sense of reality. Information disclosure, that's the easy one, right? Everybody knows about protecting secret data, right? Confidentiality, that's the easy one. And it might be something like passwords or credit card details in a database. Um, or nuclear codes like Ultron tried to steal. Anything like that. Denial of service is about attacks on availability, having the system continue to function and serve the actual users. Now, this is a lot of different ways to slice and dice this. You might be crashing the server with the incorrect parameters. You might be flooding the firewall, right? Or you might be bringing a chunk of kryptonite into the room so Superman can't do anything. Now, this might be temporary, like kryptonite. It might be permanent, like that serum that Dr. Trask tried to use to take away all the X-Men's powers. Or you all remember when Mr. Burns built that massive sunblocker for the town, right? I think you're confusing. Mr. Burns is a Simpson. He's not a superhero. But he's definitely a supervillain. Finally, we get to elevation of privileges, or as I like to call it, elevation of power. And it's all about doing things that you're not supposed to do, doing things that you don't have the privilege or authority to do, things that you're not authorized to do. It might be things like accessing the administrative con console, right? Or it might be things like the time that the Dr. Doom built a massive device to suck up everyone's powers. Finally, we take this framework and apply this to the diagram one piece at a time, one category at a time, think through, ask questions, understand, is it possible to find a threat here? And it's okay if you find a threat that fits into a few different categories. It's not a classification system. It's a focused brainstorming structure. That's it. You take one piece at a time, look at one small part of the diagram. The less you look at, the more you see. Do you have something like this for privacy threats? Actually, we do. It's actually inspired by Stride. For privacy, we also have a framework, an approach for threat modeling, and that's Linden. And Linden is also a mnemonic for linking, identifying, non repudiation detecting, data disclosure, unawareness, and non-compliance. Now, privacy threats are a bit more sophisticated than security threats. I mean, yeah. Fair point. We focus on data, on how the organization itself, the system itself, takes care of that. So let's, talk, uh, let's look at the different categories. So linking, I mentioned that before with the, the pregnancy inference example, with the superhero flying into the same house every, every time. So linking is about tying those bits and pieces of information together, and when combined, you learn a lot more. Then we have identifying, which means that you can reveal the identity of somebody. So it's like pulling off Spider-Man's mask. Um, but it's not just only about those direct identifiers. Um, identifying is also quite related to linking, because the more information you can tie together, the more easy it becomes to identify somebody, even without having their social security number or full name and address. Now, if later today you would be talking about, you know, the blonde girl that was talking about superheroes and privacy, you don't need to tell my name to know that you're talking about me, right? So, Linking can also lead to identifying. Then there's non-repudiation, which is an interesting one for security people, because for security, that can be considered a property, a requirement. For privacy, that's a threat. For privacy, we want plausible deniability. So think of the online voting system. You want to be able to, to deny how you voted. And that's perfectly fine to combine with a non-repudiation requirement from a security perspective to have proof about the fact that you actually voted, right? So, for instance, if later today somebody would find that thing in your backpack, it will be hard to deny that you were Captain Security. 
All right, then we have detecting. Detecting means that without actually having access to data, to the system, to communication, you still can reveal additional information. Think of it like side channel attacks. So for instance, if you are sending mail using an owl, pretty sure you're a member of Hogwarts secret uh, super society, right? Yes, they're one of us. Oh, so this is kind of like how the bad guys found Themyscira, you know, Wonder Woman's hidden island, simply because it was a dark spot on the map that boats and, and, and planes couldn't go there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so then we have data disclosure. Data disclosure is about minimality, about reducing information. So people like to say data is a new glitter, data is, the, uh, data is a new oil, data is the new gold. I like to say data is a new glitter. It's so shiny, it's so bright, people want to have it. But when you do, it's impossible to get rid of. People with kids will get it. For data, it's the same. The more you collect, the more responsibilities you have. And once it's in logs and in backups, it's really hard to really know where it is. So responsibility becomes tricky. So rather than just collecting just in case, really think about, do I really need those data? Should I collect them? Should I process them? Should I share them? That's minimality. Kind of like when S.H.I.E.L.D. collected all the information about all the humans and Hydra abused it with Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Zola's algorithm to target individuals. Yeah. So, unawareness. We tackled that with the dark patterns already. It's about transparency and control. So, as an individual, you should be informed about what data are being collected about you, why, and with whom they are being shared. Also, you should have some control, like you should have access to the data, your data. You should be able to update them if they're out of date. You should be able to set some privacy policies, privacy preferences, right? Um, so, I have a superhero example for you. Syndrome. Syndrome was trying to get all information about all powers of all superheroes because he wanted to build a droid to defeat all superheroes. So all those superheroes were being hired, but they had no clue who was hiring them and for what reason there was a lack of awareness. Well, like at that time, that Batman collected information about the weaknesses of the Justice League. Boy, were they pissed. Yeah. OK, final category, non-compliance. <laughs> non-compliance is actually a reminder that privacy should not be done in isolation. We can minimize, we can have de-identification techniques. Um, that's all great, but without security, without confidentiality, without legal data protection compliance, also because there is a lot of focus on data, so without data lifecycle management best practices, privacy alone will not be enough. So basically, this, this category is a call to team up to bring in the rest of the Justice League, right? You need She-Hulk and Jennifer Walters. Right. No? Yeah. No She-Hulk? Okay, so just as you were saying, this is not just a bunch of categories. This is, um, behind this is a lot of additional information. There is a big knowledge base that contains additional information that is structured according to these categories that will help you think about privacy issues, privacy problems in your system, that will guide you, that will facilitate discussion. That's really cool. So you know what, in, for a security threat, there's actually a lot of really nice tools to help us reason through the system and think about creative ways of coming up with new threats. For example, there's an open source card game called Elevation of Privilege, written by Adam Sostak. It's literally an open source game. You can download the cards from GitHub and print it out yourself. You could also order them online. And it's basically a, a way to get people to be very creative about how the system can be abused or misused or exploited th by thinking through the different categories of stride. You got anything like that? Yeah, well, actually we do. We have Linden Go. Linden Go, also inspired by Elevation of Privilege, um, is a deck of cards that contains a lot of additional information. So remember I was saying in the previous slide, there's a lot of additional information hidden underneath those different categories. That information can, for instance, be found in these cards, give, gives you guidance on how to find these privacy threats and determine whether they apply to your specific system. So basically, we both have these cool tools. We both do privacy, uh, do, do threat modeling. So, so let's talk team up. How yeah, would that even work? Right, right. Well, 
I have been talking about uh, the, the clash of perspectives, which should not be a problem. There's actually a pattern in the threat modeling manifesto that says there is a need for varied viewpoints because security can strengthen privacy and vice versa. So security is focusing like, deeply on the underlying technology, on what the system is and how to keep attackers out, right? Um, and that's really great because that helps protect the system as a whole and thereby also helps privacy. And privacy has an alternative view compared to security of how the system works at a higher, abstract le higher level of abstraction, gives you a d different view of the logical business flow, very data-centric, which is incredibly useful to align those security efforts with what actually matters to the business. For example, focusing on individuals, very often their users, or even customers, which translates directly to revenue, which is exactly the business context that we need to be mindful of and compare that on the security threat modeling side as well. Yeah, you were paying attention. Good. Now, as we go through the diagram and we model the system, we're collecting a lot of information. It's not just a drawing with circles and squares and lines. We're also collecting a lot of metadata. First off, we need to track all the assets in the system, all the different kinds of data. Where do they come from? Where do they go? Where are they stored? How are they stored? There's a world of difference between a flat text file and a distributed database. Yeah. But it's not just about data as a whole. From a privacy perspective, we need a more fine-grained view, like what are the data items specifically that we're looking at, and also the purpose. Why are we collecting them? Why are we processing them? And it's not just about the assets. It's also about what uh, solutions are already in place. What controls do we have? Like what kind of protocols are, are being used? What kind of encryption is there? Well, how is key management being done? How does the authentication mechanism work? Also, who has access to the data? So what are the access control policies? Is there any access control in place? Is there consent? Did the individuals, did the users actually consent in the processing of their information? And how is that consent managed? And there's also <coughs> a thing called PETS. Privacy enhancing technologies, which is the term to describe like all privacy related solutions, like for instance, the identification techniques such as differential privacy, K anonymity and so on. I can't say that last one. <laughs> and we're collecting all this information in the diagram. We're collecting all of this stuff. Finally, we also need to track our actors in the system. Which, what kind of users do we have? What roles do the users have? Uh, who could be the attackers in the system? And in case you missed it, individuals are key for privacy. So of course, they are an important actor. And we want to keep the outsiders out. But also, we want to focus on the organization itself, because we want to know what they are doing with the information and whether they do that in the best interest of the individuals. Another thing we need to track while we're modeling the system is all of our built-in assumptions. Implicit assumptions, we want to make them explicit. Now, while we're doing it, we might have a lot of open questions. We don't know how that technology works. We haven't decided what we're putting over there yet. There's a lot of things that you might be guessing about, educated guesses. But we need to track all these assumptions and go and validate them afterwards. Talking about unanswered questions, really the outfit. <sighs> Too harsh by far. Another approach I like to call the value-driven approach to threat modeling. It focuses on the value Ooh. chain. Sorry. Dark patterns. <laughs> it focuses on the value chain of the system that you're viewing. What are we working on? And it's about answering three very simple questions. First up is why. Why are we building this? Why do we have that component? Why does it work this way? What value is, this, is the business trying to achieve from that piece of the system? Why do we need a data? Why should users actually care? Next up is how. How does this feature, this component, actually produce that value for the business? How does this value chain actually work? How do, users get, do the users get what they care about, if at all? Finally, we could ask what do we need to do about this? What countermeasures do we need to put in place to protect that value chain, to ensure that the business actually gets that value and fix the chain to make sure that the users get what they need as well? Right. So if we bring all these different parts together, we see that 
when combining security with privacy, security actually becomes more powerful. When designing systems, if we do that while taking security and privacy into account together, then we get better, stronger, more secure results, right? So it's key to do that early by design and really to take them into account together so that you can find a solution that works for all of the different um, perspectives. All those great nuances that you only find when you work on it together. Right. Finally, right before we wrap up, we want to leave you with three calls to action. Number one, threat model everything. You're all security professionals. You all want to get better at what you're doing. Threat modeling is how we get better at this part of the job. And in case you missed it, privacy is important. So really implement privacy. Do that early on. Do that by design. And to do so, there is this, indeed this cool thing called threat modeling. So do threat modeling, do that for security. And privacy. Together. Together. <laughs> That's enough cringe for today. Before we wrap, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Before we walk off, I think that's enough cringe, it's time to actually reveal ourselves. Professor Privacy's name is actually Dr. Kim Woods. Not actually a professor. And I can't see in this, now I know how stormtroopers feel. This guy is not really a captain, this is Avi Douglas, and in person he's not that much of an ass as he was on, on stage here. Not that much. Yeah. And I am sorry about that. <laughs> And we're actually both co-authors of the Threat Modeling Manifesto, um, together with a group of really awesome other security and privacy superheroes. So Again. definitely, definitely um, a must read. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. And as Stanley says, Excelsior! Yes, thank you very much. What shall I say? A talk of a different kind, but I really, really enjoyed it. Pretty entertaining, so thank you very much for being here and presenting uh, your awesome um, acting. Are there any questions? Questions? I forgot about that part. Yeah. What the hell are you wearing? Yeah, Where did you get I keep that wondering. From? What's that? Where did you get it from? My daughter's actually yeah. made it. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. I still need my cape on for this. Yeah. Firstly, th thank you for, for this and for how you introduce it. Um, my, my question is, uh, uh, can we identify the security threats and the, pri the privacy threats um, by using one threat uh, modeling framework like Stride, or we have to use two different threat model frameworks to achieve this? Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. So a while ago, somebody, some folks actually proposed an extension to Stride called Striped. Basically, rearranged the letters and threw in a P in there because privacy is so simple and one-dimensional. Well, it turns out, as you heard, it's really not one-dimensional. It's not simple. And as Kim actually said, it's a different perspective. So you can use Stride and Lindon together. Again just basically expanding stride with, you know, six, seven more categories. And as you're going through the diagram, consider all of those. But to find one flat thing is probably not going to be simple. To be clear, there are other frameworks that yeah, yeah, yeah. try to encompass all this. The attack framework has some privacy things there, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, th there are different frameworks indeed. But mm -hmm. as you said, like, you can combine stride and Linden or find another framework that combines the two. But the essence is that you look at the security threats kind of with a different head on than the privacy threats because the one thing is protecting against the evil attackers and the other for privacy you're really looking at what are we doing and can we be doing that to the data, to the individual. So you can combine whatever you like, but you need to be aware of those different viewpoints anyways. We spent so long thinking if we can do it, we didn't think about how we could do it. The other way around, damn it, ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> we spent so long thinking about how to do it, we didn't ask ourselves, should we do it? All right, any more questions? Yeah, then, thank you again. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.